surprise it is to be here at this point. I, I thought long and hard about the right title for this talk, and I, I couldn't really come up with anything that somehow crystallised out Pete, or that was amusing. Um, it, it just wasn't working. So I fell back on something tolerably straightforward and, and dull. Um, believe me, it was dull. <laughs> Functional effects of cholinergic stimulation of the substantia nigra in the rat. I've got one slide on this, um, and then I won't talk about it again. Um, <laughs> that is the title of my PhD thesis. Okay. And therefore, this has a point. So, functional effects of cholinergic stimulation of the substantia nigra in the rat was the logical follow on from my undergraduate project, and it has been the springboard for a huge amount of what I have done. So, it's the and so on that mostly I'll talk about. The reason I bring that up, obviously, well, not quite so obviously, that Pete was not my PhD supervisor. The Pete supervised my undergraduate project, and I'll, I'll show you something ugly now. Um, this is my graduating class, the, featuring me. The, Redgrave will immediately have spotted me because he's probably still got an image of what I used to look like. So, that is actually me. Is that what when you lived with us? Yeah, that's right. The, uh, I can't help but feel that if, if we lived in a more magical universe, the, that that guy there is actually now looking out at me, going, Phil, mate, you've let yourself go. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> the, the, but that, that, that was me, long hair, and a fabulous moustache that was whittled back from what had been a beard previously. And as Randrave right, says, the, I actually lived with them for a small interregnum between my undergraduate and postgraduate career. I would actually, at this point, I'll pick up something that Paul said earlier on that I think is very pertinent. It was a lesson I learned. Um, it's a lesson I've tried to live with, and I think Pete most certainly has, about always treating students and, and your colleagues as all the same. Okay, th th we're all in this together, and it's important that we all treat each other with the appropriate dignity and respect, as we call our policy on this. <laughs> The, I, my first contact with Redgrave was in, in graduating in 76, was in 75, which is 40 years ago. I've known Pete longer than I've known my wife. Uh, <laughs> my sense that there's a sense we've got children together, <laughs> that, who are all grown up now. The, um, Pete, Pete recognised that I was about to do a project with the man who would become my PhD supervisor, he was a lovely guy, that we all loved him to bits, but essentially he was a character who'd wandered off the set of the Muppets. <laughs> um, he, he, he wasn't, he just wasn't. <laughs> the, 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 he knows exactly what I mean. So he picked me up as, a, as this undergraduate student. And my, my most vivid memory of that is um, arriving at the lab uh, early in the morning, just slightly before Pete got there, and Pete coming around the corner and seeing me there, because I couldn't get in the, the place was locked, and going, bloody hell, Pete, I didn't actually expect you to be here. <laughs> so, which was charming. And then he put me onto a project that was uh, interesting, it, it's gone a long way, but in some senses was designed to test whether I'd got the metal to be a graduate student. So what we were doing was injecting different neurotransmitter substances into the substantia nigra to look at what the effects would be. And we were looking at, we, we, we had food pellets for them to, to, to eat, water, we had wooden chips such that if they wanted just to gnaw something they could do that. Um, and the other thing that Redgrave made me do was an acid test of whether or not I had the right stuff. Um, I had to measure the rectal temperature of all these rats as we did everything. Um, so my undergraduate project was a real introduction into actual science, wrestling with rats, making micro-injections, and then getting rectal probes in and out of animals, which was um, challenging for me at that time, <laughs> um, but we got there. The interesting thing that we did with that um, was we injected noradrenaline, we injected serotonin, and we injected acetylcholine-ezrin mixtures into substantia nigra. 
And Pete knew, because he was already quite expert at that point, that dopamine neurons in the midbrain were full of acetylcholinesterase. And he rationalized that if they were full of acetylcholinesterase, they must receive a cholinergic input. That, that stuff wasn't sitting there for nothing. <coughs> now, other people argued that maybe acetylcholine had non-cholinergic functions, that it could be released, but that's a story that I don't think really developed in the way that it might have done. Um, Pete was right, there is a cholinergic input to those neurons, I'll talk about that in a moment. But with cholinergic drugs, we saw an effect, and we saw a very strong effect. Okay? The, okay. Now here's the other thing that Pete made me do. The, on the experimental uses of spaghetti, the, the, what we wanted to look at was feeding and drinking. So for, this, is, this comes from my PhD thesis. One of the ways of getting animals to eat that aren't food deprived is to give them something really nice to eat. And every rat ever born loves spaghetti or any other form of dry pasta. Um, they just eat it like crazy. But what we found was <coughs> those dependent feeding in the rat following substantial nigra acetylcholinesterase blockade, for example. So you could see that over 30, this is over 30 minutes, you'd see an effect of Ezrin. Over 90 minutes, you'd see a stronger effect. No effect on fluid consumption. Um, th that was interesting at the time because at that point in time, what everyone in behavioral neuroscience was interested in dopamine neurons for was aphadria and adipsia. You lose those neurons and the animals stop eating and drinking. And here we were providing evidence that if you actually stimulated them, you could stimulate feeding as well. That was the start of my uh, engagement with brainstem cholinergic systems. The thing that was missing from the literature at this point was any understanding of where a cholinergic innovation of substantia nigra and indeed of the ventral tegmental area might come from. The, I had a conversation, this must have been in the early 90s, I would think, with Alan Crossman, who was in St Andrews, where I was at the time, and Crossman pointed out to me that what was coming through the literature was a cholinergic system centred in the mesopontine tegmentum on the pedunculopontine or latrodorsal tegmental neuro, <coughs> nuclei, the CH5 and CH6 neurons that projected widely into the brain, as uh, Paul was explaining to us in uh, an earlier talk. The, Paul also, at that point, was starting to look at cholinergic systems, so I remember a phone conversation I had with him, I think that was our first point of contact, discussing a paper that he published showing cholinergic fibres wrapped around the dendrites of dopamine neurons in substantia nigra in the ferret, as I recall. The, as time went by, the establishment of a cholinergic input to midbrain uh, dopamine neurons became uh, clearer and clearer. So this is a summary slide of the work of Charles Blaha, Chuck Blaha, again someone who has worked very profitably with Pete. What Chuck showed over a series of experiments was that if, okay, this is a schematic of the relationship between pedunculopontine, lateral dorsal tegmental nuclei, nigra, and VTA. And it's essentially the same slide, um, but more simply presented, as the one that Paul showed earlier on from Hyamena Segovia's work, where this anterior portion of the pedunculopontine appears to impact mostly on the substantia nigra compactor, and then obviously into the chordoputamen, whereas the more posterior parts of the pedunculopontine and the uh, lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus going all the way back nearly to the locus ceruleus impact more on the ventral tegmental area. So this caudal cholinergic column, as it was called when uh, Wayne first identified this sort of stuff, has the same relationship with this system, but it, it, in an anterior-posterior way, as you see expressed across here in a, in a medial lateral way. Um, what Chuck showed is that if you electrically stimulate in the nucleus accumbens, this is using um, chronoamperometry, you see a very fast spike of dopamine release, followed by a depression, followed by this long elevation over several, several minutes um, that eventually goes away. This spike is dependent on the activation of nicotinic and ionotropic glutamate receptors in the VTA. This depression depends on M2 cholinergic receptors in the LVTG itself. And this long effect is critically dependent on the presence of M5 acetylcholine receptors. So it became well established that these mesopontine cholinergic systems had direct control 
over dopamine efflux um, through their connections with the ventral tegmental area and the compactor. I'm going to show, I'll show you just a couple of experiments. What we've gone on over the years to do is to look at the pedunculopontine to see if we can determine what this structure actually does. So this picks up the, the sorts of behavioural expertise that I got from Pete. Others picked up more of the electrophysiology or the anatomy, but this reflects very strongly the, 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 the sense of behavioural science interacting with neuroscience that I got as a student and have persisted with ever since. This is drug self-administration. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. The, um, rats have an intravenous catheter implanted. They're, they're, um, either. So this is an operant box. They can leave a press in here. When they leave a press, they get amphetamine, <coughs> one milligram in a mil. They can get up to 20 shots, and it's on an FR2 schedule. Two lever presses for every shot. Um, we had two groups of rats in this experiment. One uh, pre-trained. So they're trained in this box to respond to the food, so it's a simple training exercise. Um, just to get them used to the idea that levers have things associated with them, so that levers are good things to interact with. Another group of rats had no pre-training, so when they start on the amphetamine experiment, they've no previous experience of, um, of an operant box or what a lever might do for them. So with the pedunculopontine lesioned animals in the, in the naive condition, so there's no pre-training, if you look at control animals over sessions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this is number of infusions of amphetamine they take, and you can see that it progressively, progressively increases. So here there's some random exploration going on, but they start to get it pretty quickly, that if I press this lever but not that lever, I will get amphetamine, and that feels pretty good. Um, don't, don't do this at home, boys and girls. Um, <laughs> The, but rats love amphetamine really quite a lot. The pedunculopontine tegmental nucleus lesion guys, and these are comprehensive lesions of the pedunculopontine, that we worked a lot to make good lesions of this structure. The, reflecting the fact that, as others have talked about, if you're gonna do an experiment, do it right. Okay, do the controls, work at it, make sure that what you're dealing with is what you think you're dealing with. So these animals have uh, pedunculopontine damage, but very little damage sitting outside of it. Um, what you can see there is that they, they don't get it. They never learn to leave a press. So there's no significant difference between their performance on session eight and session one, whereas these guys obviously shot ahead. If, on the other hand, you pre-train them, what you see, obviously, initially is a, is a much higher level of lever pressing because these guys are going into these boxes expecting the lever to do something. It doesn't deliver food, it delivers amphetamine. But what you can see at this point is clearly there is no difference between the pedunculopontine lesion guys and the controls, which tells you a great deal. It tells you that these pedunculopontine tegmental nucleus lesion guys, these are bilateral lesions of the complete pedunculopontine, are notorically perfectly capable. There is no reason why they can't press levers. They're fine, they're notorically perfectly fine, a finding that we've had consistently through all of the experiments that we've done. It also tells you that they get it, they know what amphetamine is all right, so they're, they're perfectly good at understanding what a drug reward feels like, if I can use that phrase. Now, what I think this tells us is that the deficit in, in these guys, the, the not having a pedunculopontine, means that they can't do association. They can do lever press, but only if pre-trained. Only if there is a pre-existing association of lever press and outcome, they can use an association that they've already got but they can't form a new one, okay? It's a learning deficit. The, we have a whole bunch more other experiments. That's, that's I have to say, in many ways my favorite. Um, there's a lot of other experiments using various different forms of mazes and what have you that reinforce that conclusion for us. The conclusion we move towards is that what these guys have is a problem with action-outcome association, associating what they do with what comes after it. Um, and one of the classic tests for that is contingency degradation. And contingency degradation is a, a fairly simple thing. And effectively, what you're asking is, once an animal has learned an association, can it unlearn it? Can it, can it stop using it? So the way you do that is you train them up to respond for food before any surgery or anything else on a random reinforcement 20 schedule, which is quite a difficult schedule to learn. Okay? But they get it. 
So they have to put a lot of effort in to get rewards out. What you then do is split the groups into contingent and non-contingent, such that the contingent group continue on this ratio schedule. Okay, so that their legal pricing continues to have the outcome that it's already got. For the non-contingent group, you change it, such that in the non-contingent animals, legal pricing now does nothing. Okay, they will continue to get food, but it will be delivered at random intervals, such that they're getting a pattern of food that looks more like, more or less, what the way, geez, oh, more or less like what they would have had had they still been legal pressing. So the question you're asking is, the, I think I got there. The, the question you're asking is, in the non-contingent animals, do they understand that they can stop lever pressing now because their lever pressing is now meaningless? And then there's a further split. We have two groups of rats, Moussimor and Saline. So Moussimor were used effectively locally to inactivate the pedunculopontine. So these are injections, bilateral injections into PBTG. Then Saline is obviously the control. They get three sessions with drug and then we run an extinction session where there's no drug present at all and we just test their responding. And what we see with that is lovely. <laughs> Five, this is the final of the three testing sessions. So with saline, the contingent group keep lever pressing. Okay, so these are controls. Okay, they've got no reason to change what they were doing. The non-contingent group, though, drop their responding. Okay, so they get it. Within three sessions, they get it that the lever pressing they have been doing is now useless. It has no outcome, and the food will turn up whatever they do. If you put Moussimol into the Dunculopontine, you still get a lot of lever pressing, so GABA inhibition down there is not producing any motor impairment. They're still perfectly capable of lever pressing and getting the food rewards and eating them and showing contingent responding, but they also show it in the non-contingent case, non case. These animals have failed to understand that their lever pressing is now worthless. So updating an action outcome association critically depends on the integrity, or the functional integrity of the pedunculopontine. So in extinction, you see the same thing. So this is when they're actually at this point drug free, and you still see the same effect that you saw there. All of that, we believe, pushes us to, 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 to conclude that the pedunculopontine is critically important for action outcome association, that it's feeding information in potentially to systems that is of significance in determining what an animal should do, what it should select as its action. Okay, just quickly then, though I have a couple of other things just to say in terms of data. So, all the time, the, Paul alluded to this in his talk earlier on, the, Paul Bowen, the, the cholinergic neurons there, they sit there, they're big ugly neurons, it's what you can see that people have talked in the past about the pedunculopontine as the cholinergic neurons, that that's what identifies it. And the fact that we can see them and they look lovely sort of makes you think they must be doing something useful. So, given that what we've been doing had always been with excitotoxins, which are non-specific toxins, they take out neurons, they leave glia, they, 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 they produce reactive meiosis, the, the, they leave fibres of passage. We wanted a, a selective cholinergic toxin. And a guy called Stuart Clark, who was then at the University of uh, California at Irvine, working with Olivier Civelli, had developed a, a fusion toxin selective for mesopontine cholinergic neurons. It was a fusion of diphtheria toxin and urotensin 2. The urotensin 2 in this part of brain is uniquely expressed on cholinergic neurons and makes it an ideal um, target for a fusion toxin. We did the in vivo testing and we showed that this toxin works. It really works. Okay, so this is from an experiment that I'm going to describe to you now. Um, this isn't the greatest stuff. What you can see here um, is the posterior pedunculopontine. So you can hear cholinergic neurons here. This is kind of acetyl transferase, the superior cerebellar peduncle, the subpeduncular neurons, and that's what they look like. They're big and you put in the, the diphtheria toxin, your attention to, they're, they're not there. They're gone. Okay, it, it eliminates them pretty much completely. This is new end staining, and you can see that there is some loss of integrity in pedunculopontine, but there's, because we know that the cholinergic neurons are gone. Um, but there is also considerable neuronal survival through this area. The, this is the first paper we published 
So, and it's just coming out now in brain structure and function. This is the first paper we published functionally using this toxin, despite publishing on the toxin in Journal of Neurochemistry in 2008. And the reason for that is that we've run a series of experiments, and what we have continually shown with cholinergic lesions of the pedunculopontine is nothing. Um, we don't see effects. Okay? Um, in terms of what we've been doing, we see nothing, so it doesn't matter what lever pressings you have. So there's, there's fixed ratio, variable ratio, up to BR30, extinction at the end. We see no significant changes in these animals' behaviour. So all of the effects that we've seen with excitotoxic lesions that are good, they're not invalidated by this. But the suspicion you now have to have is that all of those effects, those effects on learning, those effects on action selection, are not cholinergic. They are non-cholinergic. You, you might guess glutamate, but who knows? We need to find out. The I'll come to that in a moment. The that's where we've got to with that. Interestingly enough, um, colleagues in Canada, in Marc Andre Bedard's lab, colleagues at the Open University Claire Rostrand's lab, working with this toxin, are starting to show that there might be attentional deficits in these guys. Sorry, I should go back. Roy Wise's lab has used this as well. They can't see any deficits in any form of reward processing with selective cholinergic lesions in pedunculopontine. So all of that reward, reinforcement, action selection stuff is still good down there, but it's not cholinergic. The attention is where we think we might find effects, which then brings you back into an old school, classic, ascending reticular activating system sort of deal. Um, th that's been a struggle, um, and all credit to Laszlo at Brain Structure and Function. Th this is a paper that we've published, here's another lesson for students, of entirely negative data. Okay? This is what we can't find, and it's, I think, an object lesson in science. <laughs> this is just a, just a last quick thing, a couple of last quick things. As we're doing this stuff with a cholinergic toxin, finding nothing, we, we, I'm trying to think about, let, let's, let's go back to basics. Let, let's go back to cholinergic stimulation. Not of substantia nigra now, but of the ventral tegmental area. So there is a sense for me, oh, whoops. I'm always hopeless with these things. Of going back to the start, of doing injections of cholinergic drugs back into the midbrain, into, into dopamine neurons. The difference in these experiments from the ones that I did as a graduate student is that this time, the rat does the injecting. So this is intracranial self-administration. This is rats lever pressing in order to deliver nanoliter quantities of drug direct into their own VTA. And we've been using nicotine, so this is after five sessions um, in the VTA, and what you can see, this is an active lever and inactive. With nicotine, you see a reasonable response um, selective on the active lever, just artificial CSF injections that have dropped away, they don't really do anything. Okay, that's not the strength of effect that we're led to believe that nicotine should have in the VTA. Okay, the VTA is always identified as a hot site for nicotine's reinforcing effects, and in these experiments, yeah, fine, it's got an effect, but it's not great. So we went back and did what we'd done before with amphetamine. So these guys had had no pre-training. They get equipped with, with Canley, we do the experiments and then put them into the operant chambers where they have to learn what operant chambers are as well as um, the nicotine selective response. If we pre-train them, if we pre-train them to respond for food before we do anything um, surgically to them, what you then see with nicotine is a phenomenally strong effect, a phenomenally strong effect, okay? That you don't see that, that um, the inactive lever responding remains much the same. The CSF responding remains much the same. It's a little better because they have previously been food training. But you see this wild exaggeration of responding for nicotine, which we take to mean that what cholinergic activation is doing in the VTA is not simply delivering a reward signal, but what it's delivering is reinforcement enhancement. Reinforcement enhancement is a construct that, that is starting to run through the nicotine literature. Nicotine may have directly re rewarding properties, but it also, um, and it's very clearly from human practice, has an enhancing effect on other reinforcers. People take nicotine 
after food, they take it when they're, well, they used to take it in the pub, when they were drinking. People smoke after sex. Um, it has a reinforcement enhancing property. And it's that which we believe is running through the actual segmental area. Mm. Interestingly, this is not a ubiquitous effect of nicotine, so at other sites in the brain, so this is the parallel here, this is naive, that's naive, this is pre-trained, but this site, you see actually a stronger effect of nicotine um, that is really much more impressive. Um, you see some effect of CSF, but this effect is way better than we saw there. Um, Pre-training gives you an additive effect, so you see more responding, but all you're doing is adding, in every case, a, a volume of responding to what you were seeing in the not pre-trained condition. There's no sense of this interactivity that we're seeing here. At this site, you see no effect, no selective effect here of, of nicotine. So you see responding on the active rather than inactive lever, but you get the same response with CSF and you're seeing a lot of responding. So injections down there are producing uh, what looks like somewhere between compulsive and stereotype behavior. Um, interestingly enough, I think um, this is the dorsal hippocampus. Um, this is the ventral hippocampus. Um, I'll tell you afterwards why we ended up in the hippocampus. But to us, that this, these data aren't published yet, this came out in psychopharmacology. To us, in terms of the primary rewarding effect of nicotine, the hippocampus looks like a much more potent site than does the ventral tegmental area. That's all I really wanted to say about data. So the sense of bringing this back shows that the, 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 the loopiness of science, the way that you start doing something and injecting into a place and then you come back to it 40 years later um, and you get the rat to do it for itself. It's, it seems so much simpler somehow. Um, but the exploration of the hippocampus is, in my declining years, offering me a new horizon that I may or may not explore. Fine, the, I've, I've got a last slide here of my collaborators for, for whom I'm obviously very grateful. What I'd like to do, just, just for a moment if I may, I know I'm running slightly over time, the, um, is just to say a couple of words as, as others have done about Pete. I have stories. Um, I am happy to share stories about Pete. <laughs> um, I, I will offer you a selection of stories about Pete that you can ask me about later. The, everybody knows from Pete that it's de rigueur to wear your lab coat with the collar turned up. Okay, that, you, you can't do science without the collar turned up, is what he told me. Um, so I've always done that. What Pete also instructed me in was wearing sailor's trousers. Uh, but, but he did not instruct me on what the pitfalls of wearing sailor's trousers might be. Um, I'm happy to explain that to anyone later. <laughs> um, I'm happy to explain Pete's tactics for trying to persuade young colleagues to share their hotel rooms with them. <laughs> that was ugly. <laughs> that wasn't good. The, and I'm happy to, in terms of exploring basic lab principles, um, how one determines whether or not one's looking at a dog's bollock effect. <laughs> Wonderful happy days. Days. The, um, the dog's bollock effect. Half of, my, half of my data. He's killed. What was it? No, no, no. The, uh, half of my data turned out to be that. The, a, a little more seriously, uh, one of the consequences of ageing uh, that we all do, the, um, I've reached nine on the same age as Pete. We weren't that far off in age, so I too now own a senior citizen's rail card. The, one of the consequences of ageing is a growing length of perspective. Uh, we all try. We all try to keep our work topical and contemporary. Um, and the stuff that, that, that's been demonstrated, Paul's work, for example, right to the end. Um, has just been fantastic, continually developing. But what we also develop is a remembrance of events in the distant past. So we have that perspective of stuff that we recall from 1976, the work of the Talbot, Butcher and Bilizic Jan, forgotten other than by me and Pete, I suspect. That I find myself talking to students now and just sounding old. Just sounded so old, uh, which because I start to talk about you know, 
with peptide injections into the VTL. Oh yeah, Anne Kelly did that. Yeah, she did it in 1982. So it's irritating to them and it's embarrassing to me. Um, and it's something that happens. But there is a, an interesting corollary to this. The, that length of perspective lets you see the friendship that you've developed in science, the collegiality that you've developed, um, and the value that that friendship has been through 40 years. So it has been an absolute privilege to work with Pete over that period. We first published a paper together in 1979, and exactly 40 years later, we published a small review together as well. That's been fantastic. I am so deeply indebted to Pete. I've always looked up to you. I've always thought your work was fantastic. I've always wished that I could have been as good a scientist as you. Thank you very much.